My guest today is Jen Molitor. She is a speaker, author, and she's a speaker and author of a Happy Teacher's Handbook from Overwhelmed to Inspired, Helping Teachers Embrace Resiliency. She has been an instructional coach and she is moving into her first principal role this upcoming school year at a fourth and fifth grade campus. She lives in Clarksville, Ohio. She's been an educator for 19 years and she's enjoyed teaching in the classroom and also working as a gifted intervention specialist. Her book, The Happy Teacher's Handbook, shares strategies for inspiring teachers to find a reason to stay and make their impact on the world one class at a time. Jen's superpower is getting teachers to smile again. She brings a refreshing perspective that lifts you up when you walk out of the room, reminding you of the real reason you became a teacher. When Jen is not coaching, being a principal, or at speaking engagements, she can be found writing, teaching, and soaking up the sun, and hiking with her family. She also cares for her many critters. I know Jen from being a part of the Better Leaders Better School Mastermind with Danny Dower. Welcome to the podcast, Jen. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So um, I've read your book, and I know that you uh, encourage your readers at the very beginning of your book to write down stories they have to share. A lot of educators, you know, they've gone through a lot of different experiences throughout their careers, but we don't usually think about writing things down. And um, you told me in the pre-chat about a story that you had to share about being in the trenches. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about your own story and kind of how that's led to where you are today? Yeah, I wanted to be a teacher since I was eight years old. And so it was that like one track mind and I went to college, got a teaching job and about six years in, I started feeling the overwhelm and the demands and the pressure. And I started not loving teaching. And the, the reason I went into teaching, you know, was to make an impact and to be with kids and to be creative. And I felt like I was being stifled mm -hmm. by just the, the demands of the meetings and all, all the things that you don't consider when you go to teacher education school. So I, I was kind of becoming that, te that negative teacher that you, you never plan on being, you know, the one that's venting in the hallway, complaining, you know, of course the copy is broken again, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And listening to other teachers vent about parents and then you kind of get into all this Ew, and it just doesn't feel right so i was i was there i started looking for other jobs i thought you know what maybe teaching's not the place for me maybe i should leave so i had a son my first child and going back to school teaching and trying to be a mom was heart-wrenching mm -hmm. i would go to school and cry um, and so i ended up taking a year's leave and in that, I was a nanny for another teacher. And during that year, I got certified for nutritional therapy, thinking this is my out. I mean, I was, I was at that point desperate to get out of teaching because mm -hmm. it didn't feel good anymore. It didn't feel right. I, I didn't feel like it was my soul's purpose anymore. So after that year, I was invited back part-time as a uh, second grade teacher. So I job shared. I was able to spend time with my son, and I opened a nutrition practice. So it was a really great blend. And after five years of, of trying to figure out the building my own business and, and keeping my foot in the teacher's world, I just, I had to make that decision. Do I keep progressing with nutrition and getting really uh, nitty gritty and getting more expert there? Mm -hmm. Or do I stay in teaching and get all in? And so at that pivotal moment when I'm like, oh, this is my out, I'm ready, I'm getting out, I, I took the the leap to stay. Mm -hmm. I realized that I love nutrition and I love coaching people, but what I wanted to do was make my impact. Um, I, I wanted to teach people and affect lives in that way. And I felt like education was the best place for me. So I, I let the practice go. I had just everything that I had built up, I let it go. And I redoubled my efforts back to education. And mm -hmm. that moment, it wasn't, um, like a blink of an eye moment, you know, it was just this evolution of this decision and, and, and kind of listening to my heart's calling, like, where, where am I supposed to be and how can I make this work? Because when I was teaching, it wasn't working and even half time, I mean, I was there and I did my work and I just didn't have that zest anymore. So I started looking at, uh, um, to apply to other districts 
um, and I found a position closer to home. And in this whole process, I had met some students that started changing my life and helped me re reflect on my perspective and shift that a little bit, get out of my ego more, um, start connecting with students from a different place and really seeing kids as, as people first instead of students. Once I did that and I, I just kind of recommitted myself to education, I found this newfound zest and I, I was on a mission mm -hmm. and I was happy and I couldn't wait to go to school. And I was working longer hours than I had before for less pay. I mean, I took a huge pay cut to, to do this transition, mm -hmm. but my heart said to do it. My heart said it was the right decision. So I was, I was in the trenches enough to be ready to quit being in education altogether. And I climbed my way out, did a lot of soul searching. Yeah. And now I'm so far away from the trench. I, I mean, I feel my, my career just exploding and in ways that I've never imagined. I'm going to be a principal next year. I can tell you two years ago, that wasn't on my radar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it seems like so that things are evolving. Yeah, it seems like that turning point of you having that crossroads where you have the choice to stay in the nutrition practice or return to education, that really made a, a you know, shift for you in thinking you know, that you're going to put it all in and you, you had that mind shift that you were going to be the best instructional coach you could be. You, could, you wanted to support teachers. And, and you were telling me in the pre-chat a little bit, yeah, you said two years ago you never would have thought that you would be a school leader. However, you have uh, somebody in your district that saw that pot potential in you. So how did that kind of come about? My first year in the new district, the superintendent um, stopped by and watched me. I was teaching another class. I, I was hired as a gifted intervention specialist. And um, he, he saw me in the hallway later and says, hey, walk with me. So of course, you walk with the superintendent when he says. And so he said, what? you know, what do you want to do with your life? Where do you want to go? Where do you want to see yourself? And I said, oh my gosh, I want to coach teachers. I want to support them. I want to be a resource for them. I want to help them grow. I want to get into curriculum. And he said, okay, let's chat a little bit. So we chatted and, and we talked about what instructional coaching would look like. And he's like, how about, how about we kind of transition you into that role? I was like, okay. And so I had a blended role for the rest of my career there. I was a, a gifted intervention specialist and instructional coach. And um, our director of learning innovation, he, he could see my inspiration. He, he can read me pretty well and he knows how my, how to get my wheels spinning and, and like keep pushing me to grow. Uh, and so he had me going to a uh, coaching council meetings and uh, there's a coaching institute that I went to and I've been reading books and just growing and going to curriculum meetings and just kind of like that bird pushed out of the nest and said, go fly, just mm -hmm. figure it out. Um, and it's been exciting. And, um, I can tell you that my whole energy has shifted and I feel like I'm stepping into my own, something that I didn't even know was there a few mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. Exciting. And that, that reflects a lot about um, my, my previous podcast guest, PJ Cozy, who's a superintendent. And he's talked a lot about uh, finding the potential in some of his teammates. And a lot of time adults don't get that from their leaders. They, you know, we're so used to just, kind of working uh, by ourselves and not getting this. And sometimes we, we get the support, but we don't necessarily have somebody in a leadership role that tells us, hey, this is what you're capable of. And, and as educators, we never give kudos to ourselves, right? We never put ourselves on that pedestal. So, you know, that's, that's just um, brilliant that somebody was able to see that potential in you. Um, and then you were able to work on that principal licensure uh, program and then you now you're able to go into uh, this current role and you said last year you interviewed um, for that district um, you didn't have enough experience but now that they have an opening at another school um, they saw that this is the time the timing's right and um, they're happy to have you on yeah so yeah their they're <laughs> staff their their admin team has already been so welcoming and it's tough to leave the district that pushed me out of the nest, you know, the district that gave me all these opportunities to grow. And so it's tough. And I, I'll definitely be in touch with all of them. Um, but this move, I, I just feel like was crafted for me. If, if I could, I actually did. I think it was May 5th in my journal. I wrote down exactly what I wanted for a career. And 
I think it was May 15th, they called and I was hired the next day. So I, I like part of um, the, the reason I, I wrote the book and I, I want to share my story is that I want to empower educators mm -hmm. to reach higher, mm -hmm. to, to write down those goals, like go, go out of the box. And if you could really do anything that you want, what would that be? Like go big and it can happen. Like it will happen. And if you put all your energy there and being the best you and educator you could be, oh my gosh, this guy is not even the limit. <laughs> and we're lifelong learners too. We're always pursuing uh, new areas of passion. And, you know, especially with COVID, there's a ton of professional development out there at our fingertips that's free. So I've been uh, taking advantage of that and just things like the mastermind where you can talk to other leaders and you get that non-biased support because there's people from all over the world. Um, you know, I think uh, we both have that same uh, thought process of, you know, wanting to go out there and get things and, and, and finding out you know, how, can we, how can we become better educators. So um, I know in your book, you talk a lot about, there's a lot of educators that it could be the school they're at or just the position that they've worked in for years. And, and they, they seem to be in the trenches and you know, they're overwhelmed by uh, parent phone calls, parent emails. Um, you gave an example of, you know, you have that mama who emails 13 times a day. Uh, you have little Bobby who, uh, you know, where is a certain t-shirt? I'll let readers find out what was said on that t-shirt, but you have those situations, right? Where it's just like, I don't know if I could stay in the job, right? And there's, there's just so many things being thrown at you. And you know, there, there's a lot of teachers that are probably second uh, guessing if they should stay in the profession um, after the distance learning and, and coming into the next school year with uncertainty. So how, uh, what are your thoughts about how an educator can get from overwhelmed to the I love my job? So I, I want readers to know this. When I, I taught in a district for, I think it was 16 years. Mm -hmm. It was one of Ohio's top districts I had tons of access to professional development, great pay, um, a great school system. It was amazing. People don't usually leave that school system. Mm -hmm. it, it's too amazing. However, in my role, I felt like there was something missing. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I couldn't put my hand on it, uh, but there was, there was something missing. I mean, I loved my administrators. I loved the teachers I was working with. I, I, so I, I don't know what that all was, but there was, uh, there was, I was unsettled. And so, and, and probably a little getting, I don't know. I, I mean, by that point I was not as negative. I was kind of pulling myself out of this, but I want te readers that their listeners, I want them to think about how are they feeling? What, what are they unsettled about? And if they can't figure it out, start creating that picture of what, what would be fulfilling? Like, what would it take to have you skip out of bed and be like, oh my gosh, I get to go to work today. I get to go do this role. Because once I started crafting that and reaching for that and doing it, I mean, my job lights me up. I, you know, it, it fires me up. So I, I want readers to know that I didn't go from one okay job to this glorious position. It, it was something that I needed, something that my heart, my soul, it was just something that fueled me. It wasn't like I went to this prestigious district. I left a prestigious district to, to pursue this evolution of my educator journey. So wherever teachers are in the trenches, and holy moly, I, I think so many of us can identify with that. Um, one of the, the biggest things is I think just kind of crafting that vision, that, that thing that you want. If, if you could wave that magic wand, where would you be? Like if you could just craft that position, what would you be doing? I know at one of the schools I created a before school book club for gifted kids usually those extra clubs or those extra before school times were for kids who were struggling, but our, our, you know, high achieving kids needed something too. And it was something like the teachers were like, why, why are you doing that? It's before school. You're not getting paid. It was something that, that set me on fire. I was so excited and I could be really creative and not worry about grading and that kind of stuff. So whatever that is, create that, go down that path and it might be extra work, but it's going to be work that fuels you and makes the rest of your day the rest of your career better. And it feels so good to do something awesome, you know, and creative and supporting kids. So the vision would be one part. The second part is making sure that you're scheduling um, time to take care of you. Uh, 
whatever that is, going outside, connecting with nature, whatever that hobby is, you need to keep doing that. And if it's like, oh gosh, I wish I could read a book. I never have time to do that. You need to actually put it in your calendar. Um, I think Marie Forleo says, if, if, if it ain't scheduled, it ain't happening. And so, I mean, even things like that, you know, reading, put it in your schedule and, and it will happen. Um, I think exercise is important, whether it's just walking, that's going to kind of shift your perspective, perspective and kind of get you moving in a different direction. Something else I've been doing right now is called the Miracle Morning. And that's based on the work of Hal Elrod. He wrote a book called Miracle Morning. And I've adapted it to make it fit me. But every morning, uh, I, I begin the day with prayer, um, with lots of gratitude for all the blessings in my life. And I do yoga every single morning. And if I've had, you know, if I stayed up longer one night, I might just do five minutes of yoga, just because I, I'm in that routine. I do yoga every single morning. Um, and then I also have some affirmations. And one of my favorites um, is love is at the center of all I do. And I think I got that from Danny Bauer. Um, if even if you hold on to that one, I mean, that helps set the stage for what you're doing the whole day. Um, and then just the service part, like I, I have one that says I'm here to serve because that's, that's what we are as educators. We're servant leaders. We, we want to make that difference. We want to change lives, change the world. And so those are a few tips. I think that's enough to get people started. Yeah, no, I've, I read about how you, um, you know, insist on, we, we need to realize as educators, getting sleep is so important a lot of the time. You know, especially when um, everybody was doing distance learning, they were working at odd hours and they were checking their email at odd hours and there wasn't that um, shift between being at the school and being at home. So, you know, if people are going to be in a situation in the fall where they are doing some teaching from home, people definitely need to have that time where they are saying, this is the end of the day, right? Um, and, and you pointed out how so many educators go to the doctor and you know, often the doctors say <laughs> educators seem to be the worst off when it comes to these health ailments, right? Because sometimes they just get sick and, um, you know, it ends up being pretty, something pretty serious um, that just came on just after having been stressed for such a long period of time. And, and I know my district has offered some um, yoga, um, you know, through Facebook uh, during the school shutdown and um, I know there weren't a ton of people that were on those Facebook lives, but I think, uh, you know, a lot of districts also have some sort of staff wellness page and, you know, resources where they can listen to calming music. But um, I think hearing it from somebody who's been in that position where you've uh, really crawled out of the trenches is encouraging for, for the listeners to, to know, like, you know, you don't want to get burnt out. Um, you don't want to have a heart attack, right? There are teachers that uh, just really work themselves into the ground, leaders as well. Um, and I think uh, something you mentioned um, at the end of that, the, the heart space, um, you talk a lot about uh, teaching from the heart and uh, the heart, uh, heart space when you're, when you're talking to kids and um, speaking with parents. So tell me a little bit more, uh, more about that. I think when we are first kind of going into education and the training and the experience we've had, it's really that the teacher is the authority in the classroom and I tell you what to do. And if you respect me, you're going to raise your hand and you're going to sit down and you're going to, you're going to do what I'm, I tell you to do. Because why? Because I'm the boss of the classroom. And, you know, we learn to build rapport and we give high fives and we smile and we do proximity and we do all these things. However, I, I feel like there's another layer that's subtle but deeper and more connective. Um, I, I felt like rapport always came naturally to me. Like that was something that I, I could build relationships with kids and adults. Though I think there was that layer missing at times. You know, I expected kids to sit down and listen to me and raise their hand. And, you know, now in my career, when I, um, when I pulled out my superior cognitive students, um, we would have discussions and it was, we would speak, we spoke out as, as needed. It wasn't like chaos, but um, it wasn't so much, a, I didn't have any discipline or behavior problems. I had quirky kids and things like that, but we were at a different level. And I think some of the things that I learned through this ev evolution of, of being an educator is to really take the time to get down on, on kids' levels, 
you know, looking at them in the eye, not just giving eye contact, like, ooh, look, I scanned the room and I, I kind of looked at people, but giving eye contact that looks into their, their eyes and like, I really see you. And I'm taking this time right now to really take you all in and see you, to let you know that you matter and that you're so important. And even just doing this with my own kids at home, if, if parents listening, if you can remember, like, how, how much do you give your kids eye contact? Where you really sit there in the morning, you're like, it is so good to see you. Like, I love you so much. Just that pause, that it's such a subtle, just a teeny little thing, but it makes a really big difference. Um, some of the questions I use with my kids and, and staff are different. You know, I ask, uh, what are you bringing with you today? As one of our opener questions. And the kids will say, you know, I'm, I'm worried about my dog or I'm starving or I didn't sleep last night and I haven't been sleeping all week or I'm really worried about my math test today. And when they can get that stuff out, that's the stuff they carry around that we can't see, but that is a, a little block from all the education that you wanna pour in, all those academics. And so I, I feel like it's just reframing that academics are secondary. Like we're there to, to teach people and to inspire them and empower them and the academics will come. And, and I think it's that relationship and really teaching super connected from the heart. And it's not so much about making kids listen and making them pass tests. It's about building that relationship to let, to empower them to learn, to want to learn, to be creative, to have those questions. Um, they should, they should question authority. I mean, think about what's going on right now in the world. We want them to be thinkers, not just doers. I, I don't want kids who come in and do obediently what they're told every single day. And it's just like a, a factory kind of thing. I want them to come and, and think, and I want to have discussions with them that, that matter. You know, not just if Susie had three marbles and her friend gave her five more, you know, I want, I want the depth to our conversations. Yeah, what I'm hearing you say is that uh, we need to make sure that kids have that voice in the classroom. And, you know, especially for social change, uh, that going into the fall, that kids are able to uh, you know, partner with the community. They're able to come up, up with ideas. They're able to write about their, uh, their reactions to what has been happening um, with both uh, the, the, the different, um, the, both of the things that we're dealing with right now, both with COVID and with the demonstrations that are going on in the different cities. So, um, you know, we want, uh, kids are going to lead one day. They're going to um, usher us into old age. So, we, you know, we want to entrust in them that they will make the right decisions. Um, and that leads us into um, focus word. You talked a little bit in your book about uh, every year you choose a focus word. Uh, so what was your word for 2020? I'll show you. It's connection. This is my digital, like, vision board. Mm -hmm. And so at the top of every one, I, I write my word. So this year it's connection. And I, I just want to enhance connection in all parts of my life with my family, with the people I'm working with, and, and not just like, hey, how do you do? I met a friend, mm -hmm. but like just that, that really deep, soulful connection. So that's my, my word, my commitment for the year. Great. Um, in your book, you also talk a little bit about um, the hoops kids have to jump through um, in traditional schooling, you know, to get the A, to uh, maybe... Uh, get uh, good grades so they can get into a certain college or uh, just our American school system and the different credits kids have to have to graduate. Um, so given your thoughts on uh, that uh, traditional schooling, what will your dream school be like? My dream school is flexible. And with, that, with flexible, I mean in how you learn, when you learn, the environment, the space, the grade, oh gosh, I, I, the rigidity is taken away. So I, I picture this very open air kind of campus where there are lots of outdoor spaces to learn, whether it be courtyards and the grass under trees mm -hmm. or maybe some benches out in another courtyard. I, I see a lot of outdoors, maybe a pond and some, tr like some forest where we could hike, but places that can inspire us, get us connected with nature um, and, and where we can do some of the learning out there. I, I envision um, like project-based learning where we're, we're not only 
learning skills, but we're doing something that's going to make an impact. We're doing something that's real, something that's authentic. Um, some of the fifth graders I worked with this past year, I did a survey to see who would be interested in helping me host an event for Veterans Day. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what it would look like. I just thought we should, um, somebody reached out to me from the community and said, hey, can we partner with you to host this event? And so I did a survey for all fifth grade, collected 30 kids who really were passionate about Veterans Day. They gave me some really good rationale. So I kept them in my room a couple times a week and we planned this event for Veterans Day. We ended up having um, the high school band come Two of my girls sang the Star Spangled Banner. We had slideshows, we had letters, we had thank yous. Um, we had flags that lined the whole entry up to the school. Um, we invited all the veterans in our community uh, and parents. It gives me goosebumps talking about it. It was one of the most incredible events and it was all led by the kids. I didn't go up to the stage with the microphone and say, hi, I'd like to introduce my kids. The kids introduced everything. I was on the side kind of queuing and whatever and making sure we're sticking to our agenda. They built the agenda. They crafted everything and that was something that all, we had so many skills the public keep speaking and writing and we rehearsed and these some kids were kids that weren't super engaged in coursework type of stuff you know not really showing up in math or reading but did they show up to this yes and at the end we just had a little celebration you know how did it feel what did you learn and oh my gosh the things that they learned from hosting this event were real life super authentic applicable to everything so I see that where we're, we're doing things that make a difference in the community and we're doing authentic things first and incorporating the skills into them. Um, when I think about what, how I learn best, you know, when I'm taking college classes and I have to read these books and I have to answer these really specific questions. I'm like, wow, that's not even important. That's not helping me grow. But this book, ooh, I would love this and guess what I will do with this book. I'll create a book study. I'll, I'll go to the moon with this one. So that I feel like that choice is important. Um, if kids are going to do a novel study, what novel are they going to study? And is it important that they answer our questions specifically, or is there something more open-ended that can happen? So I just, it's all of this hands-on stuff, but my, my vision is so, I feel like it's, it's like air particles <laughs> that just float around because it's not in, in a container. It, it's all out of the box, but it's all real. It's all relevant. So the kids want to come running to school because they get to work on their project. They get to work on making their impact. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have like a checklist or specifics. And that's why I feel like it's just air, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And what might be right in Florida is going to be different in Ohio based on our climate and environment and what our community needs. Mm -hmm. But I do think as we go into school in the fall, uh, there are a lot of uh, classrooms that will be spending more time outdoors. And I just remember three years ago when I was teaching high school English and took the kids outdoors to journal some, they were like, they just thought that that was the weirdest thing. <laughs> I mean, there was a hiking trail behind the school they didn't even know about. And <laughs> it was just a totally different experience for them. But you know, and we were exploring a little bit. There was uh, just somebody who tried to build something and there was a little bit of debris left. And, you know, so I just had them reflect on that in their journal. Like, what were they seeing and using descriptive language? But so often, especially at the secondary level, kids don't get out of the building and they don't know really what's around the school grounds. So, you know, I think that was a good point that you had about, um, you know, getting outside and uh, having the environment, you know, uh, maybe reflecting on nature and, um, you know, what, what can we do um, also for our community? There's so many kids that, you know, they go from the house to the school and they might be involved in sports or, um, you know, musical rehearsals, things like that, but they don't really know, you know, the people in need in the community. Um, I think, uh, for example, um, in nursing homes and assisted livings, it'll probably be a long time before those uh, people can see uh, visitors. So, um, and I know a lot of kids were writing cards to them and, and giving words of encouragement, but I think that would be a great idea for kids as we go into the fall, uh, you know, to, to make sure that we're thinking of them uh, and maybe making more videos or things like that. I think uh, just, you know, like you said, pointing out kids uh, can think of areas themselves in their own community where they can um, just lift up others and and maybe, you know, do a fundraiser or, you know, we've, we've had canned food drives for, for a long time, but what areas, uh, what, are, what are the areas of need? So, yeah, I think 
I think that's something we, we know kids have empathy, right? And we've seen that in the, in the past couple of months, but uh, I think, you know, they can make that change. So um, would you have anything? Go ahead. Uh, is there anything uh, else? Uh, is there anything else from the book that we haven't talked about um, in, in just your empowering teachers to um, make a change and, and you know, uh, their, their practice, build a report with kids, uh, maybe a little bit about um, communication with parents? Uh, are there any other things that you'd like to point out that you've learned and, and you'd like to share with the listeners? I, I think something that's different is my approach with parents. Mm -hmm. Most most teachers and a lot of administrators that I talk to, they kind of get this, oh, this parent called me again. And it's like this, I don't, it's kind of an, a nuisance. And, mm -hmm. and I remember it. I remember being there and, and having those feelings. And it's something I almost feel like we acquire from the other teachers that were around. Um, and I'm guessing it's not everywhere, but I've, I've felt that and heard that at most of the schools I've been in. And I, something that has, has really shifted in me is just this appreciation of all parents and remembering that, or just being aware that we don't know what their life is like, what they've been through, what their experiences are. We don't know what it's like to parent that child. And so many times we are stuck judging this parent. I can't believe she sent that kid to wear wearing that outfit. Or I can't believe that she's helping with this homework or not helping him. Or, you know, there, there's so many things that we just jump right on the parent. Like, oh, I can't believe they're doing it. And instead, I, I have been really taking that step back and just reaching out to that parent to, like, the same kind of thing, like I, I, I hear you and I see you and I want to understand more of what's going on mm -hmm. instead of like, oh my, this parent, are you kidding? She emailed me five times and she wants her kid challenged in fifth grade math and he's only in, you know, whatever. It, parents should be bears. They should, they should be huge supports and advocates for their children. And I tell parents that all the time, you are your biggest advocate for your child. So please keep doing that. You're not a nuisance. Email me. I want to know what happened. You know, if, if the dog ran away, it's okay to email me that. I should know so that, you know, I can be sensitive to your child. It's not something to be annoyed about. So I think we just need to remember, and I, I think it's the title of my chapter, that parents are people too. Mm -hmm. You know, parents just want the best for their kids. And I wrote a, a letter to parents, like my opening welcome letter. And it's in my book and it's also on my website for, for teachers. But it really shows a different perspective for giving parents the information they want. They want to know that their kid's going to be loved by you, mm -hmm. that they're going to make friends, that um, you know if they're hungry or starving or have a headache, that you're going to care for them before you dump math in their heads, mm -hmm. You know that you're going to make sure that their needs are met. And so I think that's just something that's different and something that might be missing from teacher education classes is just that communication and rapport building with parents too. Yeah, and I think, um... You know, I remember when I started out teaching and we'd gotten a, a sample, like, ways of how to act during parent-teacher conferences, right? And, and they might give you something when you're doing your teacher prep program, but um, you don't really know until you're in the situation yourself. And I think especially as an, I, I taught mostly secondary, but um, as an elementary school teacher, you have that kid all day. So reaching out to the parent and, and having, uh, you know, like you have in that sample, uh, letter uh, being very transparent and and telling them about the goals uh, for the year or for this particular unit I think is very informative to parents and you know a lot of them are afraid to to reach out and ask those questions uh, so um, you know being able to tell them you know this is how your children are doing uh, goes a long way um, so is there one thing that you'd like people to remember uh, as a takeaway from this show today Yeah, that, you know, being in the trenches, and I think we call it being burnout, it doesn't have to define you or where you are right now or what kind of educator you are. You can climb out of the trenches and you have the power to change the trajectory of your career, mm -hmm. the future for yourself. You can build that beautiful career that you think is maybe out of reach. You have the power to do that. And it might be going to another district. 
it might be reaching out to your administrators and saying, hey, I'd like to do this thing. You know, if you're an administrator, I remember talking to a principal and he said, you know, my dream would be going to a really small school, Mm -hmm. um, high poverty, high need, and changing it and and turning it around. I'm like, then then do that. Go do that. And even if it's taking a pay cut or something, if it's a heart decision, it's it's gonna put you in the right path. It's gonna put you in the right place. So I just want you to to leave inspired and knowing that the trench doesn't have to hold you in. You can climb out. I think those are great words to end with. Well, thank you so much for being my guest on the Out of the Trenches podcast. And if listeners would like to find out more about you, where can they find you? I'm on Twitter. Um, at Teacher Renegade. Uh, You can find me on Facebook. I have a a book page, Happy Teacher's Handbook Facebook page, and then happyteachershandbook.com. Well, thanks so much and um, have a great rest of your day and enjoy your summer and planning for next school year. Thank you. Thank you so much for the conversation.